chapter 2. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Ron, would you lead us in that, please? Yes. Glorious and merciful God, our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we are blessed with this first day of the week and this privilege to have come together here at this time that has been appointed that we may open before us your word of truth and study the deep and rich word that you have given to us to form us into the children that you would have us to be to live to your honor your glory and your praise we're grateful for brother stephen and for his study and for his efforts that he is setting forth to stir up our minds unto love and to good works and to consider the great salvation that has been given to us through your glorious son christ jesus we pray god as we now study this ephesian letter that we will extract from it the truths that you have given to us the things that will build us up in the most holy faith and to understand the distinction that you would have us to live in our lives separate from this world and the wisdom of this world and follow after those things that are heavenly and eternal we're grateful god that we are blessed with this congregation and our fellow saints we pray that you would bless each family that is here as well as those that we know of that are confined to their homes and we ask that you continue to be with them we pray god for your continued blessings upon our nation and we pray that we would not pursue a course of perversion and the things that are an abomination to you but rather embrace the things that are just and godly and holy that you have established we pray god for peace among nations we pray for those that serve in government in law enforcement and in military service and in particular those that continue to be engaged in fighting the war on terrorism for our well-being as well as that of other nations we thank you god that we can come to you and lay before you our every care our concern and calculations of life we thank you for the abundance of the blessings that you give to us as our god and our creator and we thank you that we can be together at this time to worship you to praise you and to grow in spirit and in truth and understanding and that we would be discerners in our lives between the things that are good and wholesome and pure and that which is contrary to your will be with us bless brother stephen now as he leads us through this course of study bless each of us in our lives that we might do things that are just and right and have the mind of a servant to care for one another all these things we ask in jesus name amen amen All right, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, just to set the background just a little bit, um, Ephesus being located in what was called Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, the church having been established by the Apostle Paul and his preaching and teaching there, and he's writing this letter to them while he is in prison, and we want to look at chapter 2 now. And particularly at the beginning of it here as he begins to talk about the salvation that they enjoy that was extended to them even while they had lived in rebellion toward God. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read here just verses 1 through 3 to begin with. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Who will grab that for us? Go ahead, Hank. And you he made alive, and who dead in trespass and sin, and which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the son of disobedience, among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of the wrath, just as others. Okay. So question one, I had asked, how were we dead? And I asked you to search for other passages that teach the same thing. Because there in verse one, he talks about we were dead. How were we dead? Dead spiritually. Dead spiritually. What, what's the definition of death? The absence of life. Okay, absence of life would be... 
One way to look at it. How about in James chapter 2? Just take a quick peek over there. In James chapter 2, he makes a statement here regarding the body and the spirit, and it really informs our understanding of death in James 2.26. What does it say there about the body and its death? Okay, body without the spirit is death. So when there's a separation between the body and the spirit, there's death there. Um, in the parable of the prodigal son, what does the father say about the son down toward the end of the parable there as he's talking to his older son? Okay, how how was his son dead? He was divided from his son. His son lived a prodigal life. Right. He had separated from them. He had left them. And so, really, death is a separation. That's all that it is. And here in Ephesians chapter 2, when it says we're dead, it's talking about a separation. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it talks about those who are dead, who are still living, but when they're living in sin. So it's talking about, as Rick said, a spiritual death here, being dead in sin. Now, verse 2, it says, how does it describe this death, how we once were? He describes it a particular way. Ephesians 2 2. Okay, walk. What's the idea of walked? Living. It's a manner of life. This is a, a, a way of living day by day. So he's talking about people who were living, but they were dead spiritually because of the way that they lived. And as Clint had just mentioned, according to the course of this world. What's the idea of the course of this world? What's another way to put that? The Broadway. Okay, the Broadway. Jesus talked about there's a narrow way, there's a Broadway. So how many people live in that Broadway? The yeah, the majority. Almost the whole world. Jesus talked about there's few people who walk in that narrow way. There are many who walk by that broad way. So this is the course of the world. So he's talking about the Ephesians and then, of course, us. We once lived like the majority of the world around us. We live like most other people. We, we look like them. We talk like them. We acted like them, if you will, in our lives. Um, and here's one of the things the Bible talks about. You've got the broad way, you've got the narrow way. You have the way of righteousness versus the way of sin and unrighteousness. And there's two different worldviews there. There's two different ways of looking at the world and what is right and what is the standard of right. Now, question number two, I ask, who is the prince of the power of the air and how does he rule? And how large is his kingdom? So first of all, who's the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2? 2, 2? Beelzebub. Hey, Beelzebub, what's a more common name? Satan. 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 It's talking about Satan as the prince of the power of the air. Um, how does he rule? Works through the sons of dis disobedience. Okay, works through the sons of disobedience. When we disobey, that's how he's ruled. He is ruling us. Yes. Let's look at John 8, 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus talks about this prince of the power of the air. And somebody please read John 8, 44. Who will get that for us? Charles. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. 
he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay. What, what does he do relative to us? How does he communicate with us? Worldly desires. Okay, we're going to look at that in just a second. But what we just read, what is, how does he deal with us? He lies. He lies. He's deceptive. You know, sometimes it's unfortunate that people are eager to hear lies. They don't want to hear the truth. The devil tells us those lies that we want to hear sometimes. And when he does that, he's drawing us to his side. And as was just mentioned by Paul, he appeals to our own desires. In James chapter 1, uh, it talks about you know, our desires that lure us into sin, that bring death. So the devil lies to us. He, try, he lies to us in telling us we can fulfill our desires basically in any way we want to. And it's perfectly okay. And we can do that and violate God's will. He says, you'll have a good time. There's not going to be any problem. Who did he start out with on that line of thinking? Where did he begin the lies? in the biblical record. Yeah, with Eve. Yeah, it's, everything's going to be okay. It's no problem. So, he lied from the very beginning. He lies to us today. He enslaves us to sin. Um, 1 John 5.19, what does it say about the extent of his rule? 1 John 5.19. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it talks about him being the God of this world. So he has the majority of people under his influence in the world. Again, that broad way, the prince of the power of the air. And back in Ephesians 2, verse 3, says we once conducted ourselves in this way in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, uh, following after these things, desires of the flesh, what would fall under that category? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay, you have lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. You think about things like fornication, sexual immorality, pornography, things like that. That falls under that desires of the flesh. What about desires of the mind? And Ron just mentioned, yeah, pride of life. Anger, hatred, arrogance, envy, pride, all, all those things would fall into that lust of the mind, if you will. So the desires of the flesh, desires of the mind. And he says that you were by nature children of wrath. Now, in Ephesians 2 verse 3, there is a lot of false teaching in the world around us about the idea of being by nature children of wrath. The common explanation is that Adam and Eve sin and everyone then after that was born with a sin nature. The Bible does not teach that. We each come into this world pure and righteous before the Lord. Let's look at Ezekiel 18 verse 20 just to nail that point down. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. And who can we get to read that for us? Go ahead, Clint. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Okay, so the Bible states we don't inherit the sin of our fathers. We don't do it. I'm not responsible for any sin that my father ever committed in his life. And I'm thankful for that. Because I have enough to answer for to deal with 
myself. So I don't answer for his sin. I don't answer for Adam's sin. And none of us do. None of us are guilty of Adam's sin. Um, notice Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Another point I want us to get down. In Romans 1 verse 26. Romans 1 verse 26. Who will read that for us? Go ahead, Ron. For this reason, God gave them up to the vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Okay, somebody make the point for me there. It says over in Ephesians 2 that we're by nature children of wrath. Here, what does it tell us? First of all, what's the sin he's talking about? Yeah, homosexuality. And what's he saying about it? Romans 1.26. It's against nature. It's against nature. So nature isn't evil in this passage. Yeah, it's not. Sin is against our nature. We need to understand that. You know, the, the, the religious world around us basically excuses people for committing sin saying, well, it's, that's just the way you're made. That's just the way it is. Well, God made man. God did not make man to be sinful. God made man to have fellowship with him. And God being holy cannot have fellowship with sin, so he didn't make us with a sin nature. Sin is against man's natural creation. So how is it then that Paul could say in Ephesians 2, same guy who wrote Romans, how can he say we are by nature children of wrath? It would be because of their behavior, the way they acted. Their, their disposition was one of sin. So they had a sinful, they had a sinful way of acting. Okay. And that made them of the devil in the devil's kingdom. The, the devil's kingdom is, is the people in the world who are sinful. Yes, people in the world who are sinful, the way they act, anybody want to add to that? Clint? It's the continual practice. Right. It's their nature to do this because they've made it a habit for themselves. Just as Ezekiel talks about, you know, we're all responsible for our own actions. And those actions can either continue in sin or they can continue in righteousness. Okay. Take a look real quick at Romans 2.14. Romans 2.14. While you're flipping over there, Ron, do you have a comment? Yes, as you point out in these two verses, you know, the verse over in uh, Romans 1.26, God gives them over to vile passions. This verse is talking about through their lusts, so they are giving themselves into their lusts. And so these are things that they are choosing to embrace. Yes, they, they have made a decision to do those things, to walk according to the course of this world. And Romans 2.14, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves. So what he's simply pointing out is, look, there's some people who just do what's right. So the Bible talks about by nature doing what's right, by nature doing what's wrong, and all it's saying is because of their habitual practice, because of their repeated behaviors in these things, it becomes a natural thing to them, whether that's good or evil. Um, so... I'm going to illustrate it like this. Some, some may totally get this and some of you may be like, I don't, I don't know what you're really talking about. But for me, entering passwords into my password program, I don't even have to think about it. I just type it out. And it's, I don't even have to think about the letters or the numbers or the symbols or anything. I can just do that like nothing. Okay, maybe this is a better one. Maybe some of you relate. Maybe some of you don't. Maybe this is a better one. You ever been driving somewhere, 
and it, it's a place that you go back and forth all the time and you leave and you get there and then all of a sudden you realize I have no idea how I got here. It's because by nature you're driving. It's, it's just ingrained in you. And that's what he's talking about here that when we live in sin it just becomes a natural pro there's a natural reaction to the things in the world around us and we just fall into those things again and again and again. It's a practice. Clint? Uh, what you're referring to a lot of times what we talk about in the technology world is muscle memory. Exactly. Your fingers do the talking. You have no mind at all. You're just doing. Because you've done it so many times and you just remember your, your fingers literally remember the positions on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Like athletes with golf or whatever, you know, that takes a lot of skill. They have muscle memory as well. So when they swing the club, it comes to that same spot every time on the ball. Right. It's, it, it's layered in there on a subconscious level. Hank. Remember, muscle memory doesn't come by doing it once. Right. It comes by repetitive work. In the military, we talk muscle memory from time you get up. You go to bed. It's muscle memory. Everything you do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And by the way, as as you're talking about this, um, remember Michael Jordan tried to play baseball or golf or was it both? Both. Hey, what, what's he famous for? Basketball. Basketball. Why? Is it because he's sort of a so-so athlete? No, it's because he trained for so long in his life on one thing. And that's what he was really good at. So, Mike. Yeah, I was going to say, in your illustration also, you know, how we get from one place to another, and then all of a sudden we don't realize it. You try to get somebody else in there and go, why are you going that way? We are very resistant to change the way that we do things. Right. Yeah, it's because of that muscle memory. We, In a sense, we have a spiritual memory. We, we have within us, this is just the natural way that we go, we flow, we think how we view things, how we react to things. And that's what he's talking about. By nature, you're children of wrath just as others. So you're living like the world around you. That's all he's simply saying here. So let's move on now. Let's read Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10, please. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Who will read that for us? Mike. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Okay. Question number four I ask, we are saved by grace through faith. Explain. What does it mean we are saved by grace through faith? Well, let me ask, maybe I should ask this first. What's the common teaching in the religious world around us about being saved by grace through faith? Okay. You've got a contradictory. You're saved by grace alone. Say, well, what about faith? Oh, you got to have faith in Christ and you're saved by faith alone. Well, it's either by grace alone or by faith alone. <laughs> they mean, really, they try to marry those two. They don't realize. They get confused. Go ahead. Well, being saved by grace is a, a twofold process. Grace is God's part. Acceptance and obedience is our part. That's how the faith comes in. So the faith is on our part. The grace is on God's part. Exactly. Saved by grace, God's work, God's will, God's love, God's patience, the gospel coming to us, saved by grace, God's working on that side of things. Saved by faith is our part. We believe it, we submit to it, we adhere to it, Saved by grace through faith. Um, just real quick, 
Go back to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And this is Paul at Ephesus. Acts 19 verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And here's the point. When a lot of people are taught in Ephesians 2, we're saved by grace through faith, they say that does not include water baptism. But you go back and you read where Paul actually preached to the people at Ephesus, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And so now, many years later, he writes this letter and he says, look, you've been saved by grace through faith. God's grace that you heard the gospel and your faith in obeying that gospel, believing it, accepting it, following it. So saved by grace through faith includes water baptism beyond the faith, beyond the confession, beyond turning away from sin. It includes that water baptism. It says it's a gift of God. So what does that imply? Say that again. Your obedience to the word. We have to be obedient. What about the idea of a gift? Something that's free. Kind of don't have that true pay for. Okay. So you have to accept it though. You have to receive it. You have to do what you need to do to get it. Okay. So that, that shows the action that is required in accepting God's grace is through obeying His commandments. Okay. So, Rick, if... And this isn't ever going to happen, I don't think. But if I gave you a brand new car for your birthday and said, here are the keys, but you have to go get the, the license tag, you have to pay for the insurance... You go and do that. Did you earn the car? Did you purchase the car? No. I gave you the car as a gift, but you have to do something to utilize that to make it effective unless you're just going to sit in it in your driveway. <laughs> you know, he, he still has something to do, but it's still a gift, right? Yeah, but even then, I have to take the keys from your hand. You do. I mean, yeah. Just talk about that simple. Exactly. So... When you go back and you read, for instance, Joshua chapter 6, the Lord told Joshua, I have given you Jericho. But what do the Israelites have to do to receive that gift? They had to march around. Right? And then they had to go up and take the city. It was a gift. But there's something they had to do. And when he talks here in Ephesians chapter 2 about it being a gift of God... We understand that doesn't mean there's nothing for us to do. It just means we didn't earn it. We can't work to earn it. That's not possible. In Romans chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. That is the exact same author of Ephesians writing that. And he uses the same Greek word for obey as he does faith in Ephesians chapter 2. It's translated faith in Ephesians chapter 2, but obey in uh, Romans chapter uh, 2, verse uh, 8. And that's the thing. You know, we, we just recently studied the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. In the Bible inherent within the concept or idea of faith is obedience to God. That's inherent in that idea. It's woven into it. Nancy. Uh, 
in, in regard to these two um, kingdoms, or, or these two uh, power seats, in in uh, First John, the third chapter, uh, from the beginning, where he talks about the gift that God bestowed upon us, then he goes through and describes whoever is of the devil, does the things the devil wants, whoever is of Christ, and the very reason that God gave Christ to us. Down through verse 10, he really covers this battle and where the lines are divided and what what our role is, that whoever does the things that the devil serves the devil, whoever serves the Lord does not sin. It's just pretty uh, clear cut there. And in the end, the, the last verse where he says the children of God and the children of the devil are made known this way. You can distinguish. Exactly. Look at their life. Look at the way they're living. What they're committed to. Exactly right. There is a great distinction there. And back in Ephesians 2 verse 10 it says, We are His workmanship in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're saved that we might do good works to serve our fellow man and glorify God in His kingdom and helping to advance that. Alright, I want to press on here. Let's read 11 through 18, please. Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. Who will watch it? Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and those who were near. For through him we both have access by the Spirit to the Father. Okay, so first thing I want to look at there, verse 11. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. He's saying remember where you were before. You know, forgive and forget only goes so far, especially with ourselves, right? That we need to remember where we once were, how terrible our condition was, how we were separated from God. We put sin in the past and don't let that hold us back from pressing forward and doing good, but we do need to be mindful. You know, I used to live a life that was in rebellion to God and it had terrible consequences and my fate was a fate of doom if I stayed in that. So there's some value to remembering those things because as Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1, if we don't remember that, we can easily forget and go right back into sin. And we do not want to do that. So question number five, I asked you to list five things in verse 12 that we Gentiles once were. And what implication does this have for those of other religions, religious beliefs and practices? So what are these things he lists in verse 12? Hello. Oh. Okay, hope. We're without hope. No hope. Separated from Christ. Okay, without Christ. Excluded from Israel. Excluded from Israel. Strangers of the covenant of promise. Strangers from that covenant of promise. And then without God. Without God in the world. So what kind of implication does that have on people of other religious beliefs and practices? Because let me ask you this. Were the Ephesians religious people? Yeah, yeah. they were so religious they rioted in Acts chapter 19. Um, so they were religious people, but he says this is how you were before. Without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. So what implication does this have today on people of other religious beliefs and practices? 
Well, they got a better way. I'm sorry? They, they've got a better way. They, so they've created their own way. Yeah. Okay, so there's sarcasm in your answer. There you go. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Clay and then Mike, I think. Certain things that come to my mind is when Jesus was on the earth teaching, he said, I and my Father are one. No one will have access to the Father but through me. If they deny Christ, if they deny his deity, if they deny anything about him that he proclaimed, you are without Christ. You're lost. It's a condition of being saved. Yeah. And so, you know, when he goes through those five things, you know, he starts with, if you're without Christ, you've negated yeah. your relationship with God. You know, he keeps going, but right there at Christ, all the things that he mentioned that he was or that you had to be conditionalized for, you need it, you're lost. Right. Well, I think the implication for today's religious world also is that you can come out of that. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, because the very next statement is, but now in Christ Jesus, you were only far off, have been now brought near. So, no matter how far from hope that you are, no matter how far removed you are, how excluded out of this that you were, you've now been brought near. In that, in the first century, of course, and that is for every man. No matter how far you are, you can always come to God. Yes, you can always come to God. Ron and then John. Yeah, I was just going to mention what Mike was saying. The condition of the first century Gentiles is the very same condition that exists today. What God is describing is a condition or a state we find ourselves in. Yes, exactly. John. Well, is he not saying, though, that these Gentiles had their gods, they had their belief systems, just like other religions do today, we see these coexist bumper stickers, which are nonsense. But he's saying these those people had their gods, they had their religious, but out of Christ, they're separated from God. There is no way that you can attain salvation, no matter how good you are, no matter what you believe in, unless it's God and His His Son Jesus Christ. Right. Those Gentiles were believing. And you back up. To what he said at the beginning of the chapter, you're following the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That whatever you, whichever way you were living before, this was your condition. Without God, without hope, without Christ, you're totally lost. And here's the thing about it. Those not adhering to New Testament Christianity are lost. Point blank period. There is no hope for anybody outside of a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ as is outlined and laid bare in the New Testament. That's what he's telling them. There's no degrees, there's no shades of these things. Lost is lost. And so we need to be working in, as Mike said, Okay, they're lost, but they can be redeemed. But they can be reconciled to God, which brings us to question number six. Where are men reconciled to God, and why does this matter? They're reconciled in the church. Okay. He talks about Christ being head over the church at the end of chapter 1. How about chapter 2, verse 13? What does he say? The blood of Christ is what brings you near to Him. Okay. You're brought near, but now in Christ, you're brought near because of the blood of Christ. That blood has been shed for us. We have redemption through Him. Um... What does he talk here about this? You know, he is our peace, made both one, broken down the middle wall of separation. What's that talking about? I think that we see in the cross and the resurrection <clears throat> that it becomes the great equalizer of mankind. And that now everyone has access to God, no matter if you were the commonwealth of Israel or, you know, um, or if you were a Gentile who used to worship Diana. You can now come to God. And, you know, Whenever we see this, this dividing wall being taken down, that dividing wall was not taken down because of anything that we've done. 
And he clearly states that it's because of what Christ did. So it is not by our works that all this happened. This happened because it was thought of and, and brought about long before we were, you know, uh, even born. So now it is our responsibility, as been mentioned numerous times here, is now our responsibility to recognize that and then come to Him on His terms and be created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which were beforehand thought of and put in place. Right. That wall of separation in the context here is the law that stood between the Gentile world and the Jews. And that's taken down, that's taken out of the way. Now all men have this invitation to enter into a covenant relationship with God and be His own special people, whether you're Jew or Gentile. You don't go to that law. As he, there in verse 11, he talked about, you know, the, you're called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So he's making that contrast between Jew and Gentile. And he says, when Christ gave His life, it tore that old wall down. So we can all come together as one in Christ, being a unified body in Christ. And notice verse 14, it talks about, of course, that the Lord brought us to Him, reconciled as the idea of a restored relationship. And He says in verse 16 in particular, that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. So, Men are reconciled through the cross, through Christ, through His sacrifice. Where? In the church. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, remember He said there in verse 22, And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. So Paul's already defined for us what the body is. The body is the church. And it says we're reconciled where? One body. To, one body. In one body. One body, which means what? One There's one church. That's it. There's only one church that belongs to Jesus Christ. That's it. And we're not talking about local congregations. We understand throughout the New Testament, you know, there are churches of Galatia, there's a church at Ephesus, there's one at Jerusalem, the one at Corinth, Rome, and all those things. We're talking about one universal body that belongs to the Lord. And that's all we ever read about. One universal body and then local congregations. There's nothing in between, no organization in between those two that's ever revealed in the Bible. Mike. Yeah, you know, when you read the New Testament, specifically these letters like Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, um, Philippians, Colossians, Paul wrote all of those so that they would have something they could go back to so that whenever you went to one congregation, they'd be teaching the exact same thing as this congregation over here. Not so that this congregation would have a whole different set of rules of how to get into God as opposed to this one. Exactly. So it brings unity even across those local congregations. That, that's why we have the written word. Because we can all go to that same standard. We can all say, right here it is. It's, it's not how I feel, or what you feel, or my judgment, or your judgment. It's, okay, what, what do we have written in here? Can, can I look at it in the Bible? Is that what it is teaching? So we have that unity in the one body of Christ, that one faith that has been revealed. Now, notice again Ephesians 2.16, reconciled them both to God in one body through the cross. I've heard this point made before. You know, there are people who want to say there are many bodies, so there are many churches you can be a member of. Isn't it great that you can have the church of your choice? Well, if you can have the church of your choice, can you have the cross of your choice? Right, because there were three people crucified that day. Christ was one. There was two on either side of him, or one on either side. I don't know how exactly. That what like the... you were saying on the TV show. <laughs> there, there are people that would like to be up in the church of the people on the cross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another way to put it. 
But yeah, you, there's, there's one cross and there is one body. That's it. Salvation, redemption, reconciliation through the cross, the one cross, one cross, and one body. And remember Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, just very briefly here. Remember Acts 2 verse 38. After they were convicted that Jesus was the Son of God, they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And in verse 47 it says, At the end of it, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So just to connect all of this together, we hear the gospel, we believe that, we're baptized, our sins are remitted, and at the same time the Lord adds us to the church or adds us to the body. That's why Ephesians 2.16 is saying, look, you're reconciled to God in one body through the cross, putting to death the enmity. So all of that goes together to tell us how and where we are reconciled to God. All right. Got to briefly look at verses 19 to 22. Read with me here, please. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God, in the spirit. And I ask you in question 7 to list descriptions of Christians either individually or collectively in chapter 2. So what are some of those things? How are the children of God described in chapter 2 here? Just some different ones. Saints? Saints? Fellow citizens. Fellow citizens? Members of the household of God. Members of the household of God which carries what implication? When you think of members of a household, family, it's family relationship. We have God as our Father, Christ as our elder brother. We are brothers and sisters in Christ if we're in the body of Christ, the household of God. So, body of Christ would be, or body would be another one. If you say, if you say someone's a citizen, they have to be a citizen of something so that there's an effort there. There is a, a nation or a kingdom and there is a rule of law that follows. With that. Great. Question eight. What does it mean to be a fellow citizen? So we, we've got, there's a rule of law, right? There, there's a standard, there's a law to live by. Anything else? That's the same purpose also. Same purpose, same goal, right? At least you should be. We see in our nation right now, there's not the same purpose, not the same goal, not the same law that people respect and want to follow. And boy, it causes chaos. What else? Same authority. Same authority. Clint. We have the same access to the benefits of that kingdom. Okay, there are, there are blessings to being privileges to being part of that. Still today, if you carry a blue passport in the world, that says something. That says something. Right? But along with privileges come what? We have responsibilities. As citizens, fellow citizens of the household of God. And our citizenship in heaven takes precedent, takes priority over our citizenship in any nation, including the United States. Citizenship in God's house, in God's nation, is a priority. It's greater and should take precedence over our earthly citizenship. So, he talks here about this building of God. We'll wrap up with this idea the building of God. What's he talking about? The building of God. Then he gives it another name in verse 21. I'll go back to uh, the Lord's foundation in Christ. Okay. Christ being the chief cornerstone, that off of which everything else is aligned. On but the temple. Temple. Which was the. in the. Time of the Old Testament, the household of God. That was the physical place where that was focused. Yes. 
It, he's using this Old Testament imagery of God came and dwelt among his people in that temple. And he's saying, we are the temple of God. In other words, this is, how, this is where God has fellowship with his people. Is in this house, is in this body, is in this kingdom that he has established. That's where the Lord dwells. That's where he has fellowship with his people. And where, what was it that was, it was mentioned a while ago that Ephesus, that they took great pride in? Temple of Diana. Temple of Diana. What's Paul pointing out to them? Okay, yeah, there's a true temple. You're the temple of God. Almighty God, you're that temple. The temple that you are, Ephesian saints, is greater, more magnificent, more glorious than the temple of Diana that was considered one of the ancient wonders of the world. doesn't matter what they've got. Understand what you have. What a great blessing it is to be a part of that temple of God. All right. Verse 21. Yes. That holy temple. Very good. All right. We're out of time. Thank you all very much. Lord willing, Ephesians 3 next week.